भद्रम कर्णे भीशृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये मक्षभिजत्र स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुंसस्तनु व्यशेम देवि तैयदायु ओ शांति 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 Om, O oh God, may we hear with our ears what is auspicious. O oh, ye adorable ones, may we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we sing praises to ye and enjoy with strong limbs and body the life allotted to us by the gods. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning, everyone. Today the topic is very interesting perpetual meditation do you think what is it about do you know anything about it i think you do a lot more than you think in today's world we all have our own way of coping with everyday stress turmoil, anxiety, the tragedy of our day-to-day -day life. The easiest way to deal with it is to stay busy, to distract and entertain ourselves. We don't want to face the anguish, our anguish, we don't want to deal with the frustration of having to think about our limitations and miseries that are very deep under the earth. Even though we try to run away from it, like ghosts, they keep following us and we don't seem to find peace. We try all sorts of distractions, from addictions to denial, whether we choose to see a psychologist or find more unique tools or techniques, it's really a matter of choice. Do you agree? Yes. We don't want to think about it. We just want to distract ourselves, have fun. Nobody wants to look in your own selves and see what's going on and admit, yes, I have a problem. We hear about the word yoga and meditation and we go, yep, maybe that seems to be the way. What do we do? We check out Google Apps and the Apple Store and there you find lots of applications on meditation, different type of meditations, hmm? guided meditations. There is one like the classic or and the unguided, and the guided ones, it's funny, they have different names, depending on your mood. Burnt out, feeling overwhelmed, mm -hmm. flustered, losing your temper, panicking, frustrated, fear of flying, exams, difficult conversations, or if you are in pain, you can also find a customized meditation. Or also, they also give you a different meditation for different times of the day. Mm, the early morning meditation, or waking up, or falling back to sleep, which uh, that's not too hard when it comes to meditation, right? Now the question is, is this good? Will it help us? Well, in a way, it is. It's just that it will only take care of our need for a moment, not permanently. We truly need to address the problem, our fundamental problem. Now, do you remember what our fundamental problem was? 
Let me remind you. According to our scriptures, our problem is the ignorance of who we are. The ignorance of who we are. We are no longer aware, aware of who we truly are. We offer ourselves to the world like moth, run after the fire without any discrimination. The senses drag the human soul out. Man is seeking for pleasure and for happiness where it can never, never be found. For countless ages, we are all taught that this is futile and vain. There is no happiness there. But we cannot learn. It is impossible for us to do so, except through our own experiences. We try them, and a blow comes. Like moths hurling themselves against the flame, we are hurling ourselves again and again into sense pleasures, hoping to find satisfaction there. We return again and again with fresh energy as we go on until crippled and cheated we die. That's the story of our life. Everyone likes to inquire outside, but very few have the grit to truly inquire within. Our problem in this world of nama rupa, in this world of name and form, is our individuality and identity. The soul identifies itself with what which is powerless matter. And thus weeps, the soul identifies itself with that which is powerless matter and thus weeps. It identifies itself with mortal shapes, thus with that what is subject to change. When the mind is studying an external object, it gets identified with it, loses itself. The soul of man is a piece of crystal, but it takes the color of whatever is near it. Whatever the soul touches, it has to take its color. The color is so strong, the crystal forgets itself and identifies itself with the color. The color is so strong, the crystal forgets itself and identifies itself with the color. Suppose a red flower is near the crystal and the crystal takes the color and forgets itself. It thinks it's red. We have taken the color of the body and have forgotten who we are. All the difficulties that follow come from that identity, that one and the identity with our dead body. All our fears, all worries, anxieties, troubles, mistakes, weakness, evil, all from that one blunder that we are bodies. This is the ordinary person. It is the person taking the color of the flower near to it. We are no more bodies than the crystal is the red flower. The less the thought of the body, the better. For it is the body that drags us down. It is attachment, identification, which makes us miserable. Do you want to know the secret? I bet you do. <laughs> to think that I am the spirit 
and not the body. And that the whole of this universe, with all its relations, with all its good and all its evil, is but as a series of paintings, scenes on a canvas, of which I am the witness. That is the secret. Think that I am the spirit and not this body. The practice of meditation is pursued. The crystal knows what it is. Then it takes its own color. The spirit. So what is meditation? Do you meditate? Most of you do, huh? Still, when I ask you what is meditation, you are like, well, I'm not really sure what it is, but I meditate. <laughs> Let me remind you. Meditation is a constant remembrance of the thing meditated upon, flowing like an unbroken stream of oil poured out from one vessel to another. Meditation is a constant remembrance of the thing meditated upon. Now, this is very important. The thing meditated upon, the object, flowing like an unbroken stream of oil poured out from one vessel to another. Meditation can be defined as a constant flow of similar thoughts. We do not insist upon a one particular thought. We do not insist upon one particular thought. The thoughts can change, but they must be centered on the object of meditation, unobstructed by dissimilar thoughts. Is it clear? Let us talk about then the object of meditation. Meditation can be on any, any chosen object. Through continuous and steady effort, the mind gets absorbed on the object of meditation. Once that absorption comes, effort is not required. The mind can be withdrawn from the present activity and without will. The mind dwells on the object. We know this very well already, don't we? Where are you right now? Are you here, somewhere else? What is the object of your meditation here and now? Aren't we meditating? We are meditating all the time unknowingly, or maybe knowingly, for the fortunate ones. Our worries, jobs, children, husband, daily demands. When we dwell on a particular subject as if an obsession, we cannot stop the flow of thought around the object of our meditation. When we read an interesting book or watch a movie, we go into deep meditation unknowingly. We know meditation very well, and still we want to meditate. When we want to meditate, we don't seem, we don't seem to fall in love with our object of meditation. So much so, as to dwell on it, merge in it, and, most importantly, forget ourselves. All the activities of the mind are in the form of thoughts. We should have the skill to determine the type of thought. We should be able to replace any thought by any other thought of my choice and direct it 
to my object of meditation. Meditation is not silencing the mind. It is not stopping the mind. It is not curving the mind. It is not restraining the mind. It is directing the mind, directing the thoughts, and deal with the subject matter I choose. How about that? But why can't we meditate? What are the obstacles? There are two words in Sanskrit, raga and dvesha, attachment and aversion. They are also known by likes and dislikes. When I like it, I'm attracted, and when I dislike it, I'm repulsed. Says Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, Indriya se indriya se arte, raga dvesho vyavasthito, tayor navashama gachet, tohyasya paripanti no. Attachment and aversion of the senses for their respective objects are natural. Let none come under their sway. They are their foes. They are obstacles. Attachment and aversion. These two seem to be our main obstacle in meditation. Why? When I close my eyes and decide, okay, I'm going to meditate on this particular object, thoughts come to my mind. Hmm. What are those thoughts? My likes and dislikes. This is indeed our essential obstacle. It is very tough and therefore involves great determination, great effort to confront them and move forward. In other words, what are these two, Raga and Dwesha? It is our personality. I really need to be strong enough to look at myself in the mirror and accept my limitation, redirect my efforts towards a better me, and learn to be more patient, compassionate, loving, caring, and understanding. Atma upamiena sarvatra, samam pasyati yorjuna, sukham vayadivadukham, sa yogi paramomataha. Says Sri Krishna, he who judges of pleasure or pain everywhere by the same standard as he applies to himself, that yogi or Arjuna is regarded as the highest. He who judges of pleasure and pain everywhere by the same standard as he applies to himself is great. We are not to compromise our principles, but at the same time, we should practice them. We should not fall into hypocrisy. I always say in our Vedantic work, there is a lot of uh, psychological work involved. Since we have to de redirect our habits towards, towards a, higher, a higher ideal. What is that higher ideal? The transformation of our personality. Mm. We have to see the results in our lives. Otherwise, what's the use of it? To address this problem, our scriptures talk about something called vairagyam, which means dispassion. Vairagyam is the skill of weakening attachment and aversion, likes and dislikes. They cannot be eliminated totally, so we need to be aware of them. And by dealing with them, we will sincerely take care of our emotional disruptions. In the Gita, 
Sri Krishna enumerates the characteristics of a man who has known his, himself, who has mastered himself, who is completely satisfied in his own being. He doesn't need anything external to remain steadily happy or content, who doesn't miss anything, and clearly that's our goal, that's our standard. The scriptures talk about the goal of human life, which is that kind of liberation, that kind of freedom, to be able to live intensely in this world with a clear mind, with the understanding and realization of who we are, and live from there with the understanding and realization of who we are and live from there. This liberated man has completely mastered his emotions. His mind is free from emotional disruptions and therefore he is able to enjoy. Enjoy life. He's a free soul. And the cause of this freedom is the knowledge of who he is in reality. Now, in order to get there, we have to go through a series of disciplines. Let's give directions, the right directions to our mind and thoughts because all emotional problems are in the form of mental activity, which are in the form of thoughts. Let us give proper direction to our thoughts. Let us use the mind as an instrument for our own benefit. Naturally, as I said before, the mind is attracted to the object of the senses and therefore in the belief that we are going to find complete satisfaction in the outside, our thoughts run unrestrained towards different directions. We have to discipline our mind by the use of our intellect. Arjuna says, Chanchalam himanah Krishna, Pramadhi bhalabam drudam, Tasyaham nigraham manye, vayori vasudushkaram. Verily, the mind, O Krishna, is restless, turbulent, strong, and unyielding. I regard it quite as hard to achieve its control as that of the wind. Restless man's mind is so strongly shaken in the grip of the senses. Gross and grown hard with a stubborn desire for what is worldly. How shall, he, how shall he tame it? Truly, I think the wind is no, is no wider. How shall he tame it? Truly, the wind is no wider. And the Lord says, Asam shayam mahabaho. Mano dur nigraham chalam, abhyase na tu kaunteya, peira gyena chadukchagruhyate. Yes, Arjuna, the mind is restless, no doubt, and hard to subdue, but it can be brought under control by constant practice and by the exercise of this passion. Peira and then he says, certainly, if a man has no control over his ego, if a man has no control over his ego, he will find this yoga difficult to master. But a self-controlled man can master it. If he struggles hard and uses the right means. Throughout the Gita, Sri Krishna describes his yoga. 
Now what is the yoga of Sri Krishna? He says, Prashantatma vikata bhir, Brahma chari vrate sthidaha, Manasanyama machitto, Yukta asita matparaha. So, with the heart serene and fearless, firm in the vow of renunciation and dispassion, holding the mind from its restless roaming, now let him struggle to reach my oneness, ever absorbed, his eyes on me, always his prize, his purpose. May all my actions and offerings to you be an offering to you, O Lord, we sang right at the beginning. Not just my actions, my thoughts. Hmm? Be reminded, may it be reminded of you all the time. And here it is, ever absorbed in me, his eyes on me always. Now who is me? with capital, Shri Krishna. Now who is Shri Krishna? Yo mam pasyati sarvatra, sarvam cha mai pasyati, tasya ham na pranasyami, sacha me na pranasyati, sarva bhuta stitam yo mam, pachatye ka tvamastitaha, sarvatha vartamano pi sa yogi mai vartate. That yogi, sees me in all things, and all things within me. He never loses sight of me, nor I of him. He is established in the union with me and worships me devoutedly in all beings. That yogi abides in me, no matter what his mode of life. Now, we talked about meditation. Remember what meditation was? And what did I say? That we are constantly meditating. Hmm? Our problem is that we are not aware of our object of meditation. We are obsessed with a particular thought or object. Now, if we have to pick an object of meditation to help ourselves, what would that object be? If we are going to meditate, let us choose the right object. That object should include and represent all goodness possible, the embodiment of the highest principles the human mind can aspire, that which is free and will make us free. This self, capital self, is first to be heard, then to be thought upon, and then meditated upon. Everyone can see the sky, even the very warm crawling upon the earth sees the blue sky, but how very far away it is. So it is with our ideal. It is far away, no doubt, but at the same time, we know that we must have that ideal. We must even have the highest ideal. Unfortunately, in this life, the vast majority of people are groping through this dark life without any ideal at all. Do we have an ideal? If a man with one ideal makes a thousand mistakes, I am sure that the man without one ideal makes 50,000. Therefore, it is better to have an ideal. And this ideal this ideal we must hear about as much as we can. What is our nature? Who are we? Are we bodies? 
Are you aware of yourselves right now? Remember the secret? I am the spirit. You should repeat this again and again. And this ideal we must hear about as much as we can till it enters in our hearts, into our brains, into our very veins, until it tingles in every drop of our blood and permeates every pore of our body. We must meditate upon the highest. Sri Ramakrishna says, there are two kinds of meditation, one of the formless God and the other of God with form. But meditation on the formless God is extremely difficult. In that meditation, you must wipe out all that you see and hear. You contemplate only the nature of your inner self. In order to meditate on God, one should try at first to think of him as free from what we call upadis or limitations. God is beyond upadis. He is beyond speech and mind. But it is very difficult to achieve perfection in this form of meditation. It is easier, it is easier though, to meditate, says Sri Ramakrishna, on an incarnation with name and form. God born as man. God in man. The body is a mere, mere covering. It is like a lantern with a light burning inside or like a glass case in which one sees precious things. The personal God, the God with name and form, is the highest reading that can be attained to of that impersonal by the human intellect. Do you see it? What is God? We can't define it. We can't limit God. If we define God, there will be no God, no more God. But at the same time, our reading, the highest reading, is what we call God, right? <laughs> Let that be our object of meditation. Now, meditation again is a constant remembrance of the thing meditated upon flowing like an unbroken stream of oil poured out from one vessel to another. When this kind of remembering has been attained in relation to God, since he represents the highest ideal, all bondages break. Thus it is spoken of in the scriptures regarding constant remembering as a means of liberation. Constant remembering as a means of liberation. This remembering, again, is of the same form as seeing with our eyes. Close your eyes and remember an image that represents God to you. How do you feel? What do you see? You see all the principles represented in that image of God. This remembering again is of the same form as seeing because it is of the same meaning as in this, the following passage. When he who is far and near is seen, when he who is far and near is seen, the bonds of the hearts are broken, all doubts vanish, and all effects of work disappear. He who is near can be seen, but he who is far can only be remembered. 
Nevertheless, the scripture says that we have to see him who is near as well as him who is far, thereby indicating to us that the above kind of remembering is as good as seeing. Interesting. Now, this is the practice. This remembrance, when exalted, assumes the same form as seeing. Like the flame which is kept in a breezeless place, a protected flame doesn't flicker. When the mind has been trained to remain fixed on a certain internal or external location, there comes to it the power of flowing in an unbroken current as it were, towards that point. This state is called dhyana, or meditation. When the mind has been trained to remain fixed on a certain internal or external location, you picked it. There comes to it the power of flowing in an unbroken current, as it were, towards the, that point. This state is called dhyana, or meditation. When one has so I intensified, when one has so intensified the power of dhyana, or meditation, as to be able to reject the external part of perception, as to be able be able to reject the external part of perception and remain meditating only on the internal part. What is the internal part? The meaning. That state is called samadhi. Now, who is God? What is God to you? In the Gita, Sri Krishna constantly advises us to remember him as that. That. Tuamasi. The Upanishads say. Samadhi means absorption. Samadhi means perfect concentration. Samadhi means that state in which the mind subsides, the mind is absorbed in itself, in which one's mind is absorbed in the Atma, our real nature. We don't seem to love that object of our, our meditation so much as to be able to forget ourselves. Now, calling your attention, because we all want to reunite, reunite with ourselves, to come back to ourselves. For that, we need to love our object of meditation so that we can be there, just be. Samadhi is a state in which one enjoys maximum bliss because I am experiencing my own real nature. Samadhi is a state in which I am being established. I am being established in one's own real nature. Samadhi is a state in which one has attained the highest in life. A state in which one has withdrawn from. One is free from all the sorrows. A state in which has withdrawn from. 
One is free from all the sorrows. And finally, samadhi is a state in which a person is no longer identified with the sorrows born of things that are subject to change. Why do we feel sorrow? Why are we in pain? What is the cause of that? Attachment. And aversion. That is, if the mind can first concentrate upon an object and then is able to continue in that concentration for a length of time, and then, by continued concentration, to dwell only on the internal part of the perception of which the object was the effect. Did you follow me? I'll say this again. That is, if the mind can first concentrate upon an object, and then is able to continue in that concentration for a length of time, and then, by continued concentration, to dwell only on the internal part of the perception of which the object was the effect, the meaning. This meditative state is the highest state of existence. And it can be ours. We need discipline, that's all. The yoga of Sri Krishna is expounded in the Bhagavad Gita. On one hand, we have Saguna Ishwara Dhyanam. Saguna Ishwara Dhyanam, which is meditation on what we call the personal God. Personal God with name and form. Now, this approach is mostly the approach of all religions. Hmm? We are all born and we, are, we have been introduced to a particular religion, religion and we are told that so-and-so is God with a name and a form. Hmm? We accept it. We don't question much until we grow older and we start questioning. What is this? Does this make any sense? This is an opportunity to make sense out of this. Name and form is a choice. What's important is the meaning behind what it represents. Because that is very close to us. Our scriptures say that it is of our real nature that God dwells within us as us. But not as us, as our ego. As us real self, capital self. Our problem is that we are identified with our body, body, mind complex. I am so and so. That's where the problem arises. To come back to ourselves, we need to, in the words of our scriptures, be intelligent, be smart, and use symbols. Because, my dear friends, we are subject and object of our selves. And as long as we are identified with our ego, it's hard. Now, again, on one hand we have this Saguna Ishwara Dhyanam, which is meditation on what we call the personal God. God with name and form. Nirguna Ishwara Dhyanam or Atma Dhyanam is also called Chaitanyam, Atma Swarupam. Who I am, my real nature, Chaitanyam, consciousness, perfect awareness. And that's the proof right there. What are you right now? Are you aware of yourselves? Who are you? You are your own witness. 
aren't you? There you have it. It's very close to us. Now when it comes to this nirguna ishwara dhyanam, which is this God without name and form, this type of meditation when we start meditating this way, a mysterious way, a mysterious thing happens. A very mysterious thing happens. The object and the subject becomes, become one. The object becomes the subject itself. The subject-object division goes away. I am the subject and object of my own meditation. There is no object. We simply are. Do you see it? When it comes to this meditation, without name and form, we are subject and object of ourselves. I am the subject and object of my own meditation. We simply stay where we are. Where are we? Here and now. We simply stay where we are. Being, simply being in the self, the capital self. This is of the nature of what we call at the beginning, perpetual meditation. You see? You knew about it. Perpetual meditation. Being in the self. Constantly. Whether one is walking or standing, whether one is awake or asleep, in and through all one's actions, one should contemplate this supreme consciousness which is seated in the heart and bring about, as it were, all modifications within oneself. That is perpetual meditation. Whether walking or standing, whether one is awake or asleep, in and through all one's actions, one should contemplate this supreme consciousness, awareness, which is seated in the heart and bring about, as it were, all modifications within oneself. There is no subject-object division when your awareness remains aware of awareness. There is no subject and object division when your awareness remains aware of awareness, when consciousness remain, remains conscious of consciousness itself. This is the supreme meditation. The other day I was asked, what is meditation according to your order of monks? This is what we mean by true, real meditation. This is the supreme meditation, the perpetual meditation, the continuous and unbroken awareness of the indwelling presence, inner light of consciousness. While doing whatever one is doing, while doing whatever one is doing, seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, eating, moving, sleeping, breathing, or talking, one should realize one's essential nature as pure consciousness. Thus should one worship the self Thus should one worship the self, the capital self, at all times, 
through this perpetual meditation. Awareness, remaining aware of awareness. What do you think? Sounds good, huh? <laughs> so simple, so easy. Is it really that easy? Tell me. No. Unfortunately not. Why? Why can't we meditate? What's the problem? We have a problem. Otherwise, we would just simply be in perpetual meditation, enjoying life. No sorrows. Because just like we were not aware of our already happening meditation, remember what I said at the beginning? We are constantly meditating. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are meditating on a particular object, our problems. Hmm? Constantly we come back to that thought as an obsession. Just as we were not aware of that. Even though we keep saying, we don't know how to meditate. We are meditating. Hmm? So in this case, we all love this type of meditation, the perpetual meditation, because it's already happening, no efforts. But is it true? No efforts? Mm. One second of this, of the taste, one second of the taste of this awareness will make us wake up from our slumber, will take us out of time, space, and concession. One second. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. To get there, we have to cheat ourselves a little bit. Our scriptures advised to meditate on Saguna Ishwara Brahman, or consciousness and awareness with name and form. We need symbols to be reminded of our object of meditation. Now, if we truly meditate, what's going to happen? The form will go, and the meaning will remain. And there we experience samadhi. And when that happens, boom. <laughs> we are. To get there, we have to cheat ourselves a little bit. Meditating on Saguna Ishwara Brahman, or consciousness and awareness with name and form. Now it's up to you. You pick the God, that consciousness that symbolizes God. Mm. The Hindus are great. They have so many different aspects and powers of one single God. You can pick Shiva, Mother, with, his dif with her different powers, anyone you want. But we have to do something about it. If we truly want to enjoy our life, we have to start being. Then we will be able to turn our life into a constant meditation, a constant offering, and a constant worship. Remember our song? May all my actions be an offering to you, O Lord. May all my thoughts remind me of you. Here it is. What else? May every step be a step toward you 
and may my life be a song of praise and thanksgiving. Beautiful. Let us meditate. Indeed, using symbols, there is no other way. When we do that, we will be able to turn our life into a constant meditation, offering and worship. But we always need to remember to be aware. Perpetual meditation is happening already. It's already happening. Perpetual meditation is happening already. Never forget that. Here and now. Thank you. Om Pur Namadaf Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachyate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Om that outer world is Purna, full of divine consciousness. This inner world is also Purna, full of divine consciousness. From Purna comes Purna, from fullness of divine consciousness, the world is manifested. Taking Purna from Purna, Purna indeed remains, because divine consciousness is non-dual and infinite. Om, peace, peace, peace.